Hey everyone, I'm Mr. K. Welcome back to Everything is Relative, where today we're going to be doing something a little different. We're going to be looking at the two equations for gravitational potential energy and seeing why we need two instead of just one. Now, if you are new to physics, you may have learned that gravitational potential energy, which we represent by EP, is equal to mgh. But further on in your physics journey, maybe your second year of A-levels or at university, you'll learn that Gravitational potential energy is given by the equation minus gmm over r. So we're going to discuss each of these equations. We're going to try and find a limit in which these two equations actually look the same. And we're going to show that, indeed, although they look different, we can find a situation in which these two equations are the same. So let's start by writing these two equations down. I'm going to write... The first equation that I would have been introduced to, EP is equal to MGH. And I'm going to label this as equation 1. And EP is equal to minus uppercase G, big M, little m, over R, labeled as equation 2. So let's discuss each of these equations in general and when they can be applied. So firstly... Equation 1 is for, as you've learnt it, some small object, we'll call it li mass little m, and it's very close to the Earth's surface, relatively close, close to the Earth's surface, and we use this for a lot of our dynamics. So we learn kinematics and then we learn dynamics. And we can assume that the ground level is zero. And at some height above the ground, the object with mass m has a height h. So remember, when we learn this equation, we learn that this is close to the surface of the Earth. And this is very important. So if we are close to the Earth's surface, we can say that the gain in gravitational potential energy as we raise this object from the ground to a height h, delta Ep, is the mass of the object times the free fall acceleration as we know it, times delta h. We also know this constant little g to be the gravitational field strength, and near the surface of the Earth, it's a 9.81 meters per square second, or 9.81 newtons per kg, if I refer to it as gravitational field strength. The two units, meters per square second and newton per kg, are equivalent. Now, what is delta H in this case? It's simply mg times H minus zero. As we raise the object from ground level, where its gravitational potential energy relative to the surface of the Earth is zero, to a height H. And so, simply... Numerically, this will work out to be mgh. Okay, so that's our first equation for a small object, relatively small object, close to the surface of the Earth. Now, if I study any further physics, I learn that I can apply this equation, or I can apply the idea, rather, of gravitational potential energy to two massive bodies. Let's assume we have a large object, maybe the Sun, with mass uppercase m, and then an object of much smaller mass, but still significant mass, lowercase m. The centers of these objects, we can assume them to be point masses with the mass concentrated at the center. The centers are separated by a distance r. And the gravitational potential energy stored in the system of two masses, or the gravitational potential energy of one relative to the other, more correctly, is another constant, well, with a minus sign in front, minus g times the product of the masses divided by their separation. Now, be careful, the constant here is uppercase g, and this is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, and this is measured in newton meter squared per kg squared. So it's clearly not the same 
as lowercase g that we mentioned above. This is the universal gravitational constant. So clearly these two equations don't look the same. And th is there any way that we can actually make these two equations the same to prove that we aren't lying to you with either of these? Well, actually, yes, there is. So let's take a very specific scenario. I'm going to consider the Earth as my larger mass, uppercase M, and I'm going to consider a small object. Could even be a satellite. Even though satellites are relatively large, they are still tiny in comparison to the Earth. I'm going to call the radius of the Earth uppercase R, And my second object, which is not that far above the Earth's surface, has altitude h, or height h. And what we're going to assume here is quite important, is that the object, whatever it is, tennis ball, satellite, etc., is very close to the Earth's surface. So the value of h is much less than the Earth's radius, which is 6,300 kilometers. We're talking a height of a few meters, maybe a few kilometers even. And so what this means is that h over r is a fraction, and it's a tiny fraction, much less than 1. And also, recall from what for most of you will be recent physics, that gravitational field strength, little g, is big G times the mass of the Earth in this case, or the planet, divided by r squared. Okay, and this is the gravitational field strength at the surface of the planet. So I've labeled the difference, the distances separately, r being the radius of the planet and h being the height above the surface of the planet. And so before we proceed, we just have to do a little bit of math. So if you're at this level with the physics, it's expected that you would have heard of the binomial approximation. The binomial approximation says that 1 plus x all to the power n, if I expand these term by term, I get 1 plus nx plus n into n minus 1 over 2 factorial times x squared plus another term for x cubed, and higher order terms. This is called the binomial approximation, which you, if you haven't learned in maths, you can read up, but I expect that you would if you're, you're watching this video. So why is this important? Well, I can approximate this to be 1 plus nx, and I can ignore the higher order terms, the x squareds and the x cubed, etc., if the value for x is tiny. If I have a very tiny value of x that's much less than 1 and I square it, it becomes an even smaller number, and so the second term here will just disappear, will be negligible, almost 0. And so this holds when the absolute value of x is less than 1, and nx is much less than 1. So with that little bit of mathematics, let's go back to our scenario. So what I'm going to attempt to do now is write down the change in gravitational potential energy for mass little m as I raise it from the surface of this object to a height h above the surface. So the change in gravitational potential energy is its final gravitational potential energy minus g big M little m over r plus h minus its initial gravitational potential energy at the surface of the planet minus g m m over r. And so what I get is minus g m m, and I'm going to rewrite the denominator in such a way that will help me later on, 
as if I bring out r as a common factor, as r into 1 plus h over r, and minus minus becomes a plus gmm over r. If anything, it looks like we're getting further away from the equation that we want to find. I mean, we remember we want to find ep equal to mgh. Doesn't look like we're getting any closer. But let's keep going. So I'm going to write this as minus gmm over r into 1 plus h over r all to the power minus 1. And again, the next term will just remain as it is, gmm over r. Now, if I look at the term in brackets, 1 plus h over r all to the minus 1, and I apply the binomial approximation, as I stated above, to this bracket, what I get is minus gmm over r, and I can approximate this to the first order as 1 minus h over r. And I can, can ignore the terms of h over r squared and h over r cubed, etc. And I add this to plus gmm over r. Now why can I ignore the higher order terms and do the binomial approximation? Because remember I said earlier on that h over r is much less than 1. And so h over r squared and h over r cubed, etc., high order terms are tiny and they are neglected. And again, this all goes back to our approximation that h is much smaller than, than r. The object is close to the Earth's surface, it's not too far away. So where does this approximation get me? It gets me to g m m over r with the minus sign plus g m m h over r squared plus g m m over r. And we see that the g m m over r terms cancel and what we're left with is g big M, little m, h over r squared. This still doesn't look like mgh. But wait, I can cleverly write this as m, and I can put gm over r squared in brackets times h. Why would I do this? Simply because I remember that the gravitational field strength, g, at the surface of the Earth, is given by gm over r squared. So little g is big G times m over r squared, which is the thing in brackets. And so this actually can be written as m g h. And so with a little bit of mathematics, we have shown that the two equations are indeed the same. Remember, we had to make a very important approximation, and that approximation was that h is a lot less than the radius of the Earth. The object shouldn't be too high above the Earth's surface. So neither of these equations are wrong, and neither your high school teacher nor your university lecturer have been lying to you. There's no magic here, only math. You can use either equation depending on the scenario. If you're close to the surface of the Earth and for a small object, the equation mgh works perfectly fine. If you are talking about two large objects separated by a significant distance, then you would use the equation minus gmm over r. So there's no magic, only math. Maybe math the magic? So until next time, I'll see you again on Everything is Relative.